Water coolant a system can be a daunting task, especially if it's something that you've never attempted before. But if you have built your own PC and felt comfortable doing that, then taking the next step isn't as hard as it seems. Today here at Kitgoro, we're going to be going through taking a standard build and converting it over to a full soft tubing loop. So stick around and see just how easy it can be. Hey there, Chris here for Kit Guru. So before we go any further, let's get a couple of things out of the way. Water cooling is a complex subject and I could easily write a list of over 100 questions that I regularly see on the forums and social media. And if we covered everything they entailed, then this video would be a few hours long. If you do have any questions, do drop them in the comments below and I will try my best to answer them all. Okay then, let's start with the basics. What is water cooling and why would you want to use Use it. In simple terms, water cooling a PC operates on the same principle as an engine cooling system within a car. This is where coolant is pumped through the engine and then the coolant absorbs the heat from the engine, it's moved to the radiators for the heat to be removed to the surrounding environment using a fan. By removing the hot air, this will bring the temperature of the engine down to an acceptable level and it's the same with a PC, be it as an air-cooled or water-cooled build. The key point is removing the heat from the components and exhausting sourcing it from the case. Now in some cases the right air cooler with the right chassis and fans can perform in some certain circumstances as well as a water cooled system. If you're not overclocking or demanding the very highest frame rates then an air cooled system would probably suit you just fine. Water cooling though can offer a number of benefits especially if it's done correctly. With the right setup and by maximizing our surface available on the radiators our fans then won't have to work as hard meaning we can run them at a lower RPM and this will result in a quieter system. On the other hand, if you are looking to overcut your system, the additional headroom gained in terms of temperature can allow for components to be pushed harder and for sustained periods of time, resulting in extra frames per second in games and improved performance during workload-based tasks. Of course, one of the biggest reasons we see people go for water cooling is for the aesthetics in both soft tubing and hard tubing builds. The possibilities are endless in terms of layout and design, and some members of the community see this as an Art form, spending hundreds if not thousands of hours building a truly unique system that looks just as good as it performs. Most people first venture into water cooling using an AIO or an all-in-one. These are simple water cooling solutions that incorporate everything that is needed to cool a CPU in a compact package. They are really popular and in terms of cost they can be picked up at an entry level for a similar cost to a good air cooler. Next we move on what we are looking at today and this is the system we will be using as our base. Before we even start looking at water cooling a system, we need to make sure that we have something that is actually capable of being water cooled. Today's build uses the Corsair 5000T case. It's a chassis that provides great looks and plenty of airflow, but the most important part here is that the case can support water cooling. We have space in the front, in the top, and in the back side of it to mount our water cooling components. Now, if you are building a new system and you are thinking about water cooling it in the future, Future, then now's the time to make a good decision and pick a case that can support water cooling out the box. This is going to save you from then having to swap out all your new components to a case later on that can water cool and save you some money in the process. Our 5000T is housing an MSI Z690 carbon Wi-Fi motherboard and an Intel 12900K. This is then paired with a Zotac Amp Hollow RTX 3080 graphics card. Right now the system is running an AIO to keep our CPU cool and this is using the Corsair H150i Elite Capellix cooling solution. The rest of the specs aren't too important for the focus of today's video, but this is a build that, as it stands, is more than a capable gaming system. So, we have a system that can be water-cooled, but if this is your first time doing it, then this is where it starts to get daunting. You have to choose all the right fittings, radiators, pump, and everything else that you're going to need. Now, water-cooling isn't cheap, and if you are looking to water-cool to get more performance out of an older 
shoulder base setup, then it may well be cheaper and more efficient to simply put that money that you've saved up and that you would have spent on water cooling towards new hardware instead. A jump from say a 6700K to an 11th or 12th gen CPU and motherboard, or maybe change out an old GTX 970 to a 20 or 30 series graphics card will bring more performance improvement over what water cooling and overclocking will bring. One of the reasons I've gone with a Corsair based system here is that for newcomers to water cooling, Corsair make it real easy to ensure that you get the right water cooling parts for your build. If we take our 5000T as our example and head over to the product page for this case, Corsair even list a custom loop configuration in a reference design for this chassis. This takes the guesswork out of the equation, especially if you're not exactly sure what you're going to need, and then they also have their full custom configurator on their website too. Now, I know that other manufacturers offer similar configurators, but again, I've chosen this route for the absolute beginner. When I first started water cooling systems, I know how it feels to be unsure, but by building my first loop, that gave me so much confidence and experience that when I had to do it again, it made things so much easier to understand. From there, with the knowledge I had gained when it came to build my second, my third, and my fourth loop, I knew exactly what I needed to look for and what I would need to build the next system. Let's go over exactly what is needed and follow the example of the 5000T custom reference loop. With the motherboard, we need a CPU block that is Intel compatible and we have the XC7 RGB Pro white version. This block includes all the necessary mounting hardware and it will replace the Elite Capellex we currently have installed. For our graphics card, we're gonna be using the XG7 block and we just have to make sure that we order the right one for our Zotac card. Again, the Corsair website makes this so easy to do. Put in the details of your GPU and it will show you exactly which block you need to order. I understand that fitting a graphics card block is probably one of the most daunting parts that you're going to face when putting together a loop, but don't worry, we're going to go over that a little bit later on as well. Next, we're going to need a pump and reservoir to move our coolant around. These can be separate items or, as we have in this case, combined into a single unit. This saves space and extra tubing runs. The XD5 provides a nice little compact combination unit and is white to match our case. When it comes to what radiators to use, the general rule of thumb for years has been to have at least a 120mm radiator per component. We're using two 360mm radiators for this build and that in theory gives the CPU and GPU a radiator each. The AIO we have at present is the 360 but obviously only removing the heat from our CPU but the loop will add the other 360mm radiator and that will bring the heat from the graphics card to be removed as well. Radiators are available in a huge number of configurations, thicknesses and length. But for most everyday cases though, a pair of 360s is going to be more than enough to call a single CPU and GPU setup. To go with our radiators, we're gonna need some fans and today we're using the AF120 Elites. These are not RGB, but with the case covered in RGB and our other components having it too, this is gonna give us a nice little contrast to the build. The 5000T includes three 120 millimeter LL120 mil fans to the front and they're gonna act as an intake along with our top mounted radiator while the side will act as our exhaust. Fittings and tubings are the final part of the hardware equation so that we can hook everything up to our loop. Now there are so many fittings, elbows, adapters, drain valves, bulkhead pass-throughs and other connectors out there that we could make a video just focusing on these components. But for today, again using the Corsair 5000T product page and the reference design there, we ordered exactly what was needed for this specific setup. Our tubing is what connects all the fittings together and again this needs to be matched to the size of the fittings that we are using. 1310 is a common size and what we're going to be using today and that simply means that the inside diameter is 10 millimeters and the outside is 13. 16 millimeters is another common outside diameter and you will also see G1 quarter mentioned a lot especially with fittings and radiators and this is simply the thread pattern that is used on the fittings that allows them to be screwed into our blocks radiators and pumps. One thing to note for today's build from the reference design is that we are removing the rear 120 millimeter radiator from the configuration and we will adapt the layout to take that into account. When when we have the loop ready we can add our coolant and again this is a topic that could be worthy of its own video with so many types, colors and effects out there. My simple advice would be to use one that's from a reputable manufacturer, something that's going to be suitable for long term use and one that protects all the metals in the loop, your copper,
copper, brass and even nickel from corrosion and bacteria. And the, you're going to need something that's going to allow you to run your system for a long period of time between drains and cleans. I would recommend that with any water cooling system using a good coolant that you drain, clean and refill it at least once a year. Finally, before we move on to building out our system, let's talk about loop order and honestly, it really doesn't matter. You see, once a system is up to operating temperature, then having our components in a specific order really will not have any effect on the coolant performance at all, maybe a degree here or two. Linked to this is series and parallel loops, which affects which direction the coolant flows through the system. I've built systems with both configurations and it depends on what you're looking for in terms of aesthetic. But if you remember working with electrical circuits at school, it's simply how the flow gets from one point to another. Just as loop order, this has a really minimal effect on our cooling performance. And one important thing to note is that some components do have an in and an out port on them. So we need to make sure that when we are hooking everything up together, we get them installed in the right order. Right then, so it's time to build out our system and get all of these Corsair goodies installed. To do this, the first thing I've done is remove the graphics card to get it out of the way for now, and then I've taken out the H150 Capellix AIO to prepare for installing our XC7 block. With the AIO removed, I've also given the 12900K a good clean off to remove any of the old thermal paste. The XC7 has more than 110 micro cooling fins. This is the area where the heat is transferred to our coolant, and the more surface area there is within our CPU block, the more heat can be removed. The XC7 is compatible with most common motherboards and CPUs for both Intel and AMD platforms, and comes with its own thermal paste pre-installed. The 5000T has a removable access panel where the Commander Core XT sits, and with this out of the way, I can install the CPU block backplate and then get the CPU block fitted to the front of the case. When installing the block, you just need to make sure that you tighten everything up evenly in a cross pattern and that it is only finger tight as well to the ends of the threads, and this will prevent any damage from occurring. With the block fitted, I can then tuck away the RGB cable for later when it comes on to cable management. The next job is to get all the radiators and fans fitted, but before installing a new radiator, it is a good idea to give it a flush out using distilled water. This will just help to swill out any of the manufacturing debris that's left inside that could potentially cause a blockage later on. Now for this build I have already cleaned out the radiators so next I need to get the fans installed. When you do this just take note on the orientation of the radiator in relation to where your fan cables are and this just helps keep everything really nice and neat when it comes to installing them. Our top radiator will draw in fresh air and so our fans will sit on the top of the radiator in a push configuration rather than a pull. I have had to remove the cover plate from the 5000T for our side mounted radiator. This will push hot air out the side of the case. Our top radiator needs the fitting ports to the front and the side radiator will have these ports to the bottom. Moving on, the next job is to mount the pump res combo and for looks I am torn on what to do here. Whether I mount this to the front fans or to the new installed side radiator. Radiator. Now our reference loop layout shows it mounted to the front but one of the great things about this is when you're designing your own loop is that you can have some flexibility. See the reference layout we have for the 5000T could easily be adapted to pretty much any other case with good water cooling support. If you took the Be Quiet 802 for example it is a very similar case and with a couple of tweaks to the layout you could easily get this dual 360mm radiator configuration installed. See most pump res combos will come with feet to be installed to a mounting location either within the case or to a standard 120 or 140 millimeter fan giving you plenty of versatility. Okay, now for the bit that everybody dreads, installing a GPU water block. I remember the first time I did this and I was so nervous, but overall it's not as bad as it seems. The biggest thing I find with so many graphics cards and cooler styles out there, that the hardest part is figuring out how to actually remove the stock cooler. Recently I put a block on a 3080 FE and that was an absolute nightmare. They have tiny delicate ribbon cables and trying to find all the hidden screws was just an absolute pain. Each card will 
have its own specific removal method and my advice is just to research it before taking the plunge. Most mainstream cards will have a guide out there that somebody has put together and there are loads of videos on YouTube as well to show you how to do it. Here just take your time with it, do each step really slowly and don't go in too heavy handed, especially when it comes to separating the cooler from the PCB. Now you see the thermal paste will act as a glue keeping them held together and when you pull them apart with a little bit too much force there is a tendency for them to separate with a little bit of a jolt. If this happens and they do come apart quickly and there is a ribbon cable tucked away inside there is a chance that you are going to damage it so just really do take your time with this. Just be nice and gentle. Uh, MSI 3080 Amp Hollow though is quite a straightforward card to strip down. It's very similar to the 3070 I recently modded for the Be Quiet 20th Anniversary build. And if you haven't seen the video for that then do check it out, it is a great little watch. The MSI card only has a few screws holding it all together and make sure if you do take it apart that you keep all the screws and even put them back into the cooler where you can, thread them back into the holes. That way a couple of years down the line if you do decide to refit it you know where all the screws go as well. With the graphics card stripped down I can get to installing the block following Corsair's instructions and it's great to have all our thermal pads and paste pre-installed and this is something that isn't always the case with different manufacturers. I have fitted blocks before that uses pads of all different types of thicknesses that all needed to be cut aside and installed too and for somebody new to water cooling again having all this done for you makes it a less daunting experience. Our XG7 block also comes with a full backplate and I wish Corsair also made these in a white finish just so that it would match our system and our case. With the CAD all ready it's time to get this fitted back into the 5000T ready for connecting all our fittings. Our collection of fittings is specific to what we need for this build but if you are looking to put together a soft tube in loop then I would recommend that you plan it out first. Now personally I used to draw all of my components onto a piece of paper and then just circle where I need to identify a fitting and what type of fitting it needed to be. This can just be a rough sketch and it will also give you an idea of the flow pattern too. You can draw little arrows on it. It's a great little visual aid and then you can count up how many fittings you need and what type of fittings they will be. In some cases I've placed orders for fittings for them to then turn up and I will find that I forgot something and that is totally okay. It happens a lot even to me now so do expect to sometimes place a second order for the rest of the bits that you're going to need. This is especially true on hard loop builds when you need a spacer or an elbow to help line things up. Now soft tubing builds are so much more forgiving and so much quicker to put together over a hard line based build. For some of the builds that I've done with complex bends it can take me just as long to get a single run bent and ready as it would for me to tube up a complete soft tubing system. Okay, I didn't mention it earlier, but a great advantage of a soft tubing build is that it is so easy in comparison to hard tubing in terms of building it and servicing. Granted, they don't look quite as good as hardline builds, but for a more functional approach and relatively good looks, then they are a worthy option and again are cheaper to put together over a hardline based system. Both types do exactly the same job, but for functionality alone, soft tubing is certainly the way to go. Now I'm installing all our fittings following the reference design and it really does bring this close to completion. When installing these don't over tighten them and set aside all the fitting caps so that they are ready for when you are ready for tubing. Some fittings do have an internal allen key fitting so that they can be tightened up with a tool but you will generally find this more with hard tubing fittings rather than soft tubing. Take care of the o-ring seals as well when you are installing them and then go around and double check that they are all tight before moving on to fitting the tubing itself. When you are measuring up for the runs allow a little bit extra hose length so that it can be trimmed down. I generally start with the longest runs to the shortest so that any offcuts can potentially be used for smaller runs later on. I personally use a Stanley blade to make all the cuts it makes them nice and clean and flush just take your time or you can use a pair of sharp scissors here and just mark the tubes with a pen so you can see where it needs to be cut as well. When cutting the tubing give it a test fit and let it sit for a while. Now some curvy runs may start to kink once they've been in position for a while and we don't want that to happen. Cut the tube in long enough so that it finds its own resting position that's not overly long but gives it enough slack that it doesn't kink. With our hoses cut to size we can slide on the fitting caps and start installing the runs. I like to get the ones in the tightest spaces done first before moving on to the ones that are more accessible. Now you may have noticed that the loop order has changed. Once I got all the fittings 
screens installed as per the reference design, it just didn't look right. And again, one of the great things about custom loops is that you can change your mind. To reduce the length of the runs and make the loop cleaner, I have flipped the side mounted radiator and it's a simple change that makes a huge difference. Comparing the reference layout to my own configuration, it really does show just how much a simple tweak can change how a whole system looks. Right then, now our loop is ready to fill, but there is one more job to do and that is pressure testing. This is simply filling the system with air under pressure, using a tester and seeing if that pressure drops. If it does, then we have a leak and we need to find it, but if it stays constant, then we are all good to go. Some people will test this for days, others a few minutes. Personally I tend to give mine around half an hour and I find that is good enough. Up to now I have never ever had a system leak so fingers crossed for this one that it all goes well. Our system is holding pressure so it is good to go but now it is time for cable management and hook everything up. I do this as a last step because if you do it earlier and then find a problem all you have to do is waste your time, cut all your tie wraps off and start again, find the problem and then build it all back up. With everything now ready it's time to add our coolant and for this I've decided to go with purple, I think it's going to contrast with the white really well. When filling up a system grab yourself a fill bottle and then start filling it via the fill port on the reservoir. Here use some paper towels to catch up any spills and then top it off as much as you can. When it's full refit the cover cap and make sure it's tight and then power on the system for a few seconds to allow the coolant to be pushed around the system from the pump. This can be one of the most time consuming parts of the build but again just take it slow fill it up and top it off and then power on the system until you have it full. Sometimes getting air out of a system can be a nightmare. I have had this where I've had to power up systems and then literally tilt them upside down to get the air moving back to the reservoir. Once it's back to the reservoir it can then be released to the atmosphere and then topped up again with coolant. With the system full it's a good idea to let it run and just keep an eye on the temperatures in BIOS maybe over a couple of days and you may see the coolant level has dropped. Now providing you have no leaks this will just be the small pockets of air that have finally moved around and made their way back to the res. Just again top it up and keep an eye on the level it should settle fairly quickly. So that's our custom loop all done and as I said earlier it really isn't as hard to do as you may think. With a little bit of patience you can easily put together a full loop like this within a single day and by building your first loop again it really does help to build your confidence and experience for the future. The key to any loop software or hard tubing is in the planning stage making sure you get the right case and the right cooling parts to suit your needs. Because this is a custom loop there are so many ways you could adapt this and you could even take it not necessarily one step further but one step back. Now you see we had the 360 millimeter Capellix installed earlier so another way to potentially save money is that if you've already got a good AIO or a good air cooler already installed then simply add a radiator and a small loop purely for your graphics card. Okay so I said earlier that water cooling the system can help reduce temperatures and give us some headroom for overclocking. So let's take a look at our testing from with the Capellix AIO installed and then with our custom loop to see how it affected our thermals. I ran two configurations using the balanced and the extreme profiles from within the Corsair IQ software and everything else has been left to default to ensure the results are as comparable as possible. CPU package temperature was measured within a number of tests. The 12900K is a hot chip and so the R23 temperatures here reflect that in both single and multi-core and also between our AIO and custom loop. I didn't expect to see much change here given that the CPU still effectively has a 360mm radiator and we've added our GPU to the configuration. PC Mark 10 did see some good improvements once we moved from the balance to the extreme profile on the AIO and then again when moving to water cooling. In time spy our custom loop really did help to knock those temperatures down considerably with around a 20 degree drop overall. Now let's look at GPU temperatures when running our game benchmarks. We have around a 30% reduction on average, so now we have some headroom to look at overclocking our GPU to maybe boost our frame rates. This is really where water cooling does start to come into its own and it gives you the flexibility to overclock and set up a custom fan profile or clock the fans down and have a quieter system. Whatever you're using your system for, then the benefits are there when it comes to water cooling and now you can see that building a loop isn't as hard as you have made 
first thought. If you are looking to build a loop, then I hope this video has helped you in some little way. And if you do have any questions for me at all, then please do drop them in the comments and I will get back to you on them as soon as possible. Before I go, I just want to say a huge thank you to Corsair for making this video possible, sending over everything that was needed to put it all together, along with MSI and Zotac for supplying the motherboard and the graphics card. As always, you can head on over to kitguru.net for all the latest hardware news, join us over on Discord and check out our social media pages too. Why not send over some photos of your own custom loops? For today though, I've been Christopher Kitguru, I'll see you again for the next one.